Hello, and welcome back to Veteran Instincts. We are bringing you a game from the recent Tauntaun Invitational Tournament between Adam Freeman and Ollie Pocknell. Adam, going to you first, uh, we can see you here with a sort of four-ship Imperial list. Talk us through it and tell us a little bit about what got you to flying it. Okay, so I basically lost to this list or a version of it in the 2019 system open that Simon Pone ran through me with it despite the fact that I absolutely diced him he still just walked over me with it and it's kind of been in the back of my mind since then he ran it with pure Sabak instead of echo just thought it'd be a good list to throw out and see if I could get some use out of it and we've got Vader with Afterburners, Echo with Ruthless and Passive Sensors, Lieutenant Sai in the shuttle with the title and an Academy Pilot, because that's exactly how many points you have left. Cool. And I think I know what Vader, Echo and the Academy do, but um, just remind me about Sai and particularly about the ST3C1 title. Okay, so when Sai coordinates, if he coordinates an action that he himself has, he can also do that action, which is basically code for he will coordinate a focus and get a focus. And the title allows him to then take a lock on a ship at range 1 to 3 of the ship that he's coordinating. So he can coordinate the academy, a focus, get a focus himself, and lock something within range of the academy. Nice. So nice action efficiency there built into the one ship. And Ollie, a kind of archetype that we've seen you run a bit of before. Talk us through it and you can see here that you run with Dash rather than Han, who's the other thing that fits in this slot. And maybe tell us a bit about why you went for Dash here. Yeah, so I was flying this list back when the Nantex was a massive menace and I couldn't really think of a better ship to deal with six three agility ships than Dash Rendar because chucking out two four dice shots a turn, which is the whole point of having uh, Bistan in this list is the best way to kill them. He's a bit better at it than Han because he can move straight over the rocks. And honestly, I was at a bit of a loss what to play at this point because it was just before the points changes happened. So I thought, you know what? It didn't work quite so well at the time, but let's bring it back out because it wasn't a terrible list. And uh, I think it's got some promise, especially in the present meta. So the whole purpose of this is that Wedge will inevitably die as he points at things. Uh, and But his job is to punch hard and he gets punched. And then once he is dead, especially with Jake's support, just handing Dash a double focus token every turn. It's really, really difficult to end game against the big fat Dash Rendal with two uh, shots every turn. So that was the thinking behind building the list in that by, by whatever on your opponent's side gets to the end game, it shouldn't be able to kill Dash. Cool. And Adam, we can see sort of rocks going down here and, and the ship's starting to be placed. I always think Dash is a sort of pretty unique problem in x-wing most of the time the range you want to engage something at is pretty obvious you know if you're low agility high high attack dice then range one's probably better for you higher agility ships tend to fare better at range three and dash kind of turns that on his head a little bit and that's even before you start thinking about his ability to just run over obstacles uh, without a care in the world with the setup and and with the rocks in particular what is there anything you could do to help yourself so the rock setup is, I'm pre, I was pretty happy with it. Uh, the idea was to push in obstacles onto Ollie's side of the board, knowing how fast a large base has to move, to hopefully try and force the engagement away from those obstacles and keep us on an even keel when it comes to Dash's ability. In terms of my setup, that's pretty much how I've set up the list because I think it gives you good flexibility with Echo and you can sort of use the shuttle to try and dictate engagements by herding things in the correct direction. Game plan wise, it's pretty much we've got to try and kill Dash. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds very sensible. And I think that the point about the obstacles is a good one. We've spoken about that a little bit before and I tend to advocate putting obstacles on your own side of the board if you're trying to reduce their impact on the game because you can sort of blast past them turn one. But actually... With your shuttle being slow and with the A-wing and dash, as you say, being quick and having to keep moving forwards, um, reversing it for this particular matchup, I think, is really sensible. Ollie, when I've played against dash, you obviously want to get to range one, particularly with this double-tapping dash. It, it makes dodging the arcs easier. And obviously, rather than a normal range one engagement where both ships are, are getting extra dice and you're just kind of crossing your fingers that you've got more mods or slightly better positioning with dash you get a definite benefit that his damage output goes down whilst yours is going up but getting there is easier said than done so i i tend to try and kind of spread a net go pretty slowly and and try and catch him in a corner 
as the dash player, how do you avoid that? Well, you can see that one of the first things I've done is set up in the opposite corner. Obviously, dash wants time. And realistically, what he wants you to do is he wants you to set up that net, but only if he can then break the net, if you like. So he needs you to spread your ships nice and widely so he can then use the fact that these asteroids are in the way of you and not him and slip past. So what I'm hoping here is that I can stall for a bit of time. Um, I can use these asteroids, especially the, uh, the two rocks that I've placed. So there's the one on the far left of the board. That was to keep it out of the way of Dash. And then the one at the top of the board is to provide the shuttle problems. So you can see I've got this little area, this little square of asteroids that Dash realistically wants to be playing in. And hopefully he can wait around in there and stall the shuttle out. And then because it's so slow and uh, it can't turn very well, get behind the shuttle and start getting reasonable shots into Vader and the other ships. So it sounds like Ollie wanting to engage in this square of rocks up on the top right hand corner of the board and Adam you wanting to kind of stay away from that maybe maybe top left of the board where there's no obstacles. So it'll be interesting to see over these first few turns which of you kind of wins that battle and which is, is better at doing it. We're starting to see the moves here. A TIE fighter coming out and rolling across presumably going to be blocking Psy there just holding him back a bit. Adam that's something you see a lot from shuttle players. In fact even more than that you go for the stop. Why is that so common with the shuttle? Why do people not like it to move very far on terminal? So the quicker the shuttle moves, the easier it is for things to get around it. In fact, there's an argument to say that I should have deployed the shuttle fully into the corner just to keep a little bit more distance. If the shuttle stays further away, especially a shuttle that can maintain double mods, it allows you to just threaten with it. Like I say it's kind of like herding the ships around by just pointing it towards an area uh, or making Ollie think it's going to point towards an area and then he has to deal with that as soon as he gets past the shuttle or the, sh or the shuttle goes past him, that threat disappears and then it is a pretty expensive coordinate bot. Yeah, and because it has that super accurate shot and a three dice gun, that cone of its attack arc is a really big place that especially ships like Wedge don't want to be. Um, I've got to avoid that at all costs. So as Adam's saying, it's a really effective tool, but only if you can slow it down enough that I can't use my superior mobility to get into the right position. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting, again, with Dash, changing things up a bit. And I think the standard approach for the shuttle is to try and get it at range three in that initial engagement. So you can have sort of at least two, if not three turns of rolling towards the fight, because once you're past it, you know, even with the rear arc these days, you know, it's it's kind of hard to, to keep it being relevant. And, and as you say, Adam, in this particular shuttle, you've spent a fair number of points on getting it double mod. So it's, it's nice to keep that big gun online for as long as possible. However, that range three engagement may not be exactly what you want against Dash. So interesting to see as the game unfolds, what that Dash versus the shuttle uh, kind of fight is going to look like. Ollie opening up here, turning Jake away, unsurprisingly, want to get him near Dash and presumably don't want him to jazz the entire list on his own. And Dash and Wedge here set up facing along the board. Is there a sort of clever reason for that rather than facing inboard like people normally do? So with the initial setup, I was doing it so that Dash, if he wanted to, could stall into Wedge. Obviously, with the idea of the shuttle setting up where it is and with that big rock setting up where it is, I was thinking it would take a couple of turns for the shuttle to get to where it wanted to be. My whole thinking here is planning to stall out Adam and just try to get him to commit to one direction or the other. If I can make it look like my ships are going in a single direction as much as possible, I can maybe bait him into moving that way. And in any game where it's dash versus something like a shuttle, the first 15 minutes of the game is going to be jockeying for position and making sure that you're trying to get your opponent to get a little bit far forwards than they realistically want to. So my whole thinking with Dash and Wedge is going up a side and then turning away and either leaving Wedge on that side as bait or if Adam turns away from Wedge, which is realistically what I want him to do, I want him to chase Dash. But it, if he doesn't chase Dash, then Dash gets around the side. So there isn't really a good situation if I can get that right and split them up after using them as bait. Yeah, and it's a fine balance, isn't it? As you said, you want them coming from different directions so that whichever one Adam bites on, the other one is free for a few turns to get a nice position. But timing that is is critical because what you absolutely can't have is Wedge getting jumped on and killed before Dash has got into that flanking position. So you're going to need everything to be synchronized and happen on the perfect turn. Um, I think we've got a different approach to the game, Ollie, but, but I think the thing we do similarly 
uh, to each other is is the kind of patience. Mm. I think a lot of the games that I do well in, uh, which unfortunately is far fewer than the number of games you do well in, I do well by not committing until my opponent has committed. And even though I tend to take the more kind of aggressive bullying lists versus your AC lists, that aspect of the game is the same, I think, where, where neither of us are going to commit to an engagement, commit to a lane through rocks before the opponent has. Adam, is that similar to your play style or are you someone who, who likes to be much more aggressive and really force the issue and kind of force your opponent maybe into a mistake i do generally like to play more aggressive lists um, i play a lot of rebels a lot of the joust and stuff i'm really the new hera a-wing um, as i think we were talking about beforehand this list was kind of an experiment on trying to play a little bit more patient vader you can't just sort of straight up run down the middle echo same thing echo thrives on staying out of arcs and not getting shot at all and taking taking good shots in return. So normally I would be I'd be trying to be a bit more aggressive, but I'm aware here, especially with again, especially with the shuttle, I can't be too aggressive or I risk the shuttle becoming a non factor. Absolutely. And talking of Echo there, we can see you doing a really nice job of utilizing Echo's Bendy D cloak to sort of simultaneously keep her with your ships, not get her stuck out on her own and vulnerable, but always be facing at a slightly different angle, you know, the ability to to threaten a different area of the board. It seems like quite a small thing, but the opening couple of turns of just keeping your options open with her being really nice. Um, Vader here, a little bit more aggressive, getting out ahead of the list a little bit. What was the kind of plan with Vader here? Were you using him to herd stuff away or...? Yeah, the plan is to go fast with Vader, get him sort of around the top. So if Ollie goes slow and tries to stick in that area, Vader can hopefully try and sort of get him behind. Especially now he's barreled out, I know it's unlikely that he's sort of coming back down his own board edge towards me. So this is really interesting because this is where I think Adam very slightly got the better of me. Because my initial plan in this game was while dash was stressed here it seems as if i'm going to do a, a one forwards or a two forwards to clear that stress and come up the board as adam said what i really wanted to do was i wanted to do a one hard with dash this turn and keep his stress and allow wedge to sort of carry on going up, up the board so again as i said this was the turn i was going to split them and allow dash to sort of stay hiding behind the rocks and wedge would come up and play on the flank but because vader is down over here Adam made me change my game plan because I'm thinking immediately, okay, so it's going to take Vader a while to get around to where he needs to be. So if I can suddenly be a bit more aggressive, then I might be able to catch Echo and that TIE fighter, and maybe maybe the shuttle, um, on their own before his big hammer gets involved. Now, obviously, I've got to be careful because of the fact that where Vader is, he could just do a hard two and be right back in the game come through the center of those rocks so this is i'm i'm almost trying to to bait for one more turn before i try and leave vader sort of stranded on his own on the other side of the board and see if i can get away with that now so game plan has changed <laughs> mid-game that's really interesting right I, I really like the idea of that stress almost being a kind of fake out right like i i would look at your position there and absolutely assume that you were now running along the top board edge, you're kind of forced into doing that and would be turning my list to deal with that. And obviously the risk of doing that, if, if Adam here is to turn everything hard left, then he could end up with three quarters of his list out of position. So that's a really nice sort of like bluff there. And I think uh, that would have been a good plan. However, Vader's position changes everything, right? And not only has it tempted you to head into this open space in the hope of getting an engagement where Vader isn't involved, I think it's cut off any ability for, for Wedge to head down your board edge, hasn't it? The, the hard two from Wedge here might have been quite nice, you know, a different way of splitting Dash and Wedge up. But with Vader there, I don't think that Wedge can head off on his own towards Vader. I think that that is probably a trade that you lose. Yeah, exactly. And a one on one, especially with Vader moving second, Wedge doesn't like that trade. And if it was a pretty big initiative roll at the start of the game, uh, obviously we're both on the same points here. So with me losing the initiative, it meant that Wedge had to be a lot more careful because if Wedge is moving second, he can go from out of range into range two. And Vader's only shooting him with two dice because he still doesn't have that target lock. So it's it's such a big advantage against Vader if you're moving uh, moving second. So it immediately causes me to be a bit more careful and as you can see dash is kind of 
do, having to do that and we're we're trying to keep our distance going on opposite sides of the board and yeah i i think the mo thing i was most scared of here was if i did that hard one with dash on that turn instead of just coming up the board if fader had done a hard three and an afterburners boost he could have caught dash at range one on the next turn when i had to clear my stress and dash would have been in a really bad position so i almost couldn't now risk doing that hard one turn just because of the threat even if it wasn't going to happen i felt like i could have lost the game if that series of situations ended up occurring so i didn't want to take the risk this early on to put myself in that position and adam we see you with vader here sort of continuing up into the corner did you consider the three hard into this lane through all the obstacles or or is that a bit too aggressive, Vader, a bit too sort of out on his own? I did consider it, but it was just the case of I didn't necessarily want to get trapped headlong with Wedge in that lane without much to, um, much to be able to protect Vader. Because the one thing that Vader doesn't want to do in this list, I mean, ideally doesn't want to take five dice from Dash, but the main thing is I can't have him go headlong into Wedge. So even with me moving last, like Ollie said, that's not necessarily a fight that I trade efficiently into. All it takes is for one good roll on Ollie's part, one poor roll on my part, and I lose a hell of a lot more points than Ollie does. Yeah, absolutely. And then although this sounds really obvious, I don't know if we've ever kind of called it out on the stream before, you know, rule one, I think, and Ollie can correct me here because he is a much better race player than I am, but rule one of arc dodging is you want to be approaching your opponent at 45 degrees. If you are head on, it's much, much more difficult to reposition to a point where you have a shot and your opponent doesn't. Whereas if you can approach at that 45 degree angle, uh, then all of a sudden, the ability to get out of arc and still stay close and get a good shot yourself, um, it's its much, much more easy. So I like the Vader position here along the top of the board because, again, I think it's meaning that it's hard for Wedge to turn in down this lane because not only now is Vader there on the flank, but he's going to be facing the TIE Fighter and potentially the shuttle as well. Echo in an interesting spot here. Um, presumably going to be coming back towards the list next turn. Yeah, he's a cool piece to threaten the flank. It's really tough to do that against Dash because, again, you make the wrong move. I get too aggressive and decloak out. All it takes is for Dash to come in incredibly quickly, especially when Jake can pass a focus over. Ollie moves up three banks, rotates, and Echo gets destroyed. So uh, we've got to sort of leave that as an option, give Ollie something to think about. But realistically, that there was no way I was going outside the rock towards Dash here. Yeah, Echo 1v1 versus Dash uh, feels feels like a bad proposition, doesn't it? So we see that decloak from Echo. Uh, TIE Fighter turning in. Not quite got into the lane. Um, wonder if uh, you're going to have to barrel here. And indeed, we do see that just to get yourself nicely lined up down the centre. Um, not a problem this turn. Uh, I don't think there's anything that can get into range to shoot. I mean, maybe Wedge if he boosts, uh, but that doesn't seem too problematic. Uh, and a bank in from the shuttle. And then Ollie, over to you. We've got Jake here, and we've seen you play Jake and Dash before on the channel. And you used Jake almost entirely as a support piece previously. Is that him in every game, or are there games or situations where you can be a bit more aggressive with him? No, there are certain games where you have to be more aggressive. And I think in a game like this, you have to identify what is jake most useful for when it's three ships against four ships normally it's making sure that one of your ships is double modded and because of that you will trade more effectively the times when jake is more useful out on his own is when either he can bait or distract part of your opponent's list say for example you're playing against an eight ship swarm and that those games are normally when jake decides to go off on his own because he can operate as an ace in his in his own right when he is the highest initiative on the board. If you're playing against a group of ships that are initiative one, two, or three, uh, then he really does shine. The other thing that he can be incredibly useful for, which is why I most of the time use him in that support role, is he is not just a focus battery, but he can also use his ability when Wedge's wings are closed to give Wedge a boost, which means that with full information, you can choose where Wedge is going to end up after you've dialed in whatever move you, you'd like to. So most of the time he's a support ship, but in certain situations, 
uh, he does end up being that aggressive piece. Yeah, and that's been my experience as well. And actually, one of the reasons that I prefer Han rather than Dash is that Han is that little bit more independent. And at that point, you can use Jake to coordinate Wedge and, and get effectively double modded uh, shots from both of your I-6 big guns. Um, so we see quite an interesting board state sort of starting to appear here. Adam's done a really nice job so far of spreading that net. And actually, Ollie, it's looking like he's forced you into the area of the board that he wanted you in. Um, so, so far, sort of upper hand looks to be to Adam. I was a bit worried, Adam, by the bow roll out with Vader last turn, but I'm, I'm glad to see here a, a kind of early afterburners use. Can you talk us through why you did that and also thoughts on, on afterburners? I know a lot of people kind of keep it for the end game and keep it for running away, but, but you're using it differently here. So me and Ollie talked about this um, at the time and after the game, how um, it's potentially a small mistake to send Vader around the back of the debris. Um, as I said before, I, I, I wanted to guard against the risk of having to go head on with Wedge. But as soon as Ollie does the move that he's done to put Wedge around that small rock, I need Vader into the fight. Because if Vader doesn't do that burners boost, then my options for the following turn look a bit more limited. Because now I've got all of the straight moves to be able to get to where I need to be. I understand why people use burners to run away, but I think it's better to use them, or at least one of them, early to get the engage that you want. And I feel like that's potentially more important than having the second one from running away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, in an ideal world, you get the engage without needing to use them. Um, but certainly, once the choice is, oh, Vader is not going to be involved for a couple of turns, or I'm using one of my afterburners charges, then I think, you know, you use those afterburner charges all day. And also, there is some value in uh, in using them to kind of be surprisingly able to get back into the fight. You know, it, hmm. I, mean, I think I might have been tempted to think, ah, oh, I'm safe here, Vader's out of the fight. And I wouldn't really have been thinking about those afterburners and, and what now looks like a really lovely lane to get back in. Well, this is the thing. And what we've seen over these first couple of turns is a really interesting sort of swap of the momentum between both players whilst being nowhere near each other. And this is why I love the positional game of X-Wing, because with that barrel roll, Adam sort of gave the strength over to me, because if you're talking about that net at the start, then Echo is the weak point of that net on the left-hand side. And you can see that I've raced to get there. Now I know that Vader is out of position after the barrel roll. However, with that afterburners boost, he may have had to spend resources to do it, but he's now closed the gap. He's closed the net onto Wedge. And you can see here that Wedge is in a really, really bad position. And if I had decided to do the hard two and turn into this channel, instead of being where I am now, Wedge would have been in so much danger uh, because there is a TIE fighter, there's a shuttle and Vader all coming towards him and he will lose that joust. So I'm now forced to have to think really carefully with Wedge. Uh, because, again, he may have spent a charge early, but I think that was probably one of the most value uh, afterburners boosts that I've seen in a game for a long time, just because of the amount of difference it made to the game state at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We see an Echo D cloak out here. Sensible, I think. Again, I'd have been tempted to get more aggressive on this turn and maybe make this the turn that the net was closing. Um, but as you said before, you don't want to be engaging with Echo and only Echo. And as such a high value piece, you don't really want to give Dash a good shot into Echo when you can maybe put other things like the shuttle in the way first. The tie position here, Adam, looks a little bit suboptimal. Yeah, this turn, as, um, as we'll see in a second, is a case of me picking the optimal move potentially for each ship right now in a vacuum when I picked each move. Um, so the tie's got a nice three hard or two hard into that channel to the left for next turn, which puts some pressure on the side of Wedge if Wedge is going to stay there and also prevents Wedge from coming into that channel. But also it causes issues for my positioning for Vader. So I think it was a good move, but I could have just gone the one faster and I'd have been fine. Yeah, with that one hard on the TIE Fighter, you'd have still been able to tuck back in. As it is, forced the barrel away from, from Jake, which is no bad thing. Jake, obviously, very manoeuvrable and, and able to cope with that quite nicely. Ollie, any thought about hard-turning Wedge left here on this turn? It, it feels like a bad idea. I was seriously considering it because right here you can see the barrel roll wasn't to get out of range. The barrel roll was to make sure that both of my ships got focus tokens. 
Um, so being with Jake's position, Wedge could have then boosted this turn and then done uh, one bank and then another one bank into the same position that the, uh, the free hard would have put him uh, with no risk of landing on the asteroid either. I was seriously considering it because I thought, well, Vader's coming in, so let's turn to meet him. The problem was I wasn't sure on Echo. I wasn't sure whether Adam would choose this turn to be super aggressive with both Echo and the shuttle. And again, Wedge ends up jousting all of Adam's list at once. So it was, it was really a, okay, what, what do I do with Wedge here? So I made sure that I gave him as much opportunity as possible to do everything. So looking at where Adam's ships were, I thought, okay, I've got the focus token. Um, I can choose whether or not to boost. But uh, in the end, as uh, I think we're just about to see, I decided to, basically, as we were talking about earlier, you take the turn that your opponent is expecting you to engage and try and delay it. So this is what I'm attempting to do with Wedge here. I'm just thinking, okay, do I open my foils? Do I close my foils? This is why I'm t it's taking so long to decide what Wedge is going to do. In the end, I decide it's too risky. And bec the only reason I, I decided to barrel out is because where that TIE fighter is. Because I know that Vader can no longer get the five forward and the boost. I was expecting Adam to do the same as me, delay the engagement turn by one, and just do a one forwards with Vader and threaten. So that's why Wedge decides, nope, it's not worth it. And we're going to barrel away and try and get a better engagement next turn. And we get the, the bump from Vader there. So it does look like we're not going to be seeing any fire this turn. And both of you now in slightly awkward positions, maybe more so from Adam than Ollie. Ollie, obviously Wedge sort of stopping the turns to the left from Dash, but I can't imagine Dash is doing anything other than a thank to the right next turn. Adam, how did you see the position here going into what is likely to be an engagement next turn? Are you happy, unhappy? So the two things I'm not best pleased about looking at it from this position is the shuttle's incredibly close to the debris. So as I said earlier, there's an argument for deploying the shuttle in the corner. Uh, and it just adds that extra bit of distance because this really limits my move because the one bank's incredibly close, the two bank's incredibly close, the three bank is red. Non-great options. Um, the other ones, obviously, I'm not particularly pleased with sending Vader into the TIE Fighter. As I said, the five of the TIE Fighter gets him clear and then Vader drops into that spot and then rolls out. Uh, or doesn't, depending on how I'm how I'm feeling, and then I've got this really aggressive three bank with the repositions and the afterburners if I need them to make sure that I get a good result. So, yeah, those were sort of key small errors that put me into some rough positions. Um, and I think, like Ollie said about the momentum swinging backwards and forwards in the in the sort of jockeying for position stage, it's definitely swinging back towards Ollie at this stage here. I was genuinely surprised that you didn't, on either of those two turns previously, hard turn the shuttle, because either a one back, a hard turn, uh, uh, two turns earlier, and then a one forwards, or the yeah the hard turn of the previous turn, I think would have put you in a nicer position on the debris. But I think in the same situation as I didn't want to turn wedge into this channel because Vader was threatening, it was probably a similar situation of oh if I go turn too early, then maybe Dash can get behind me. Yeah, the worry was also that you could have sort of one-hearted, one-hearted with Dash across those two turns and gone back, and then the, the shuttle's gone. So I had to sort of leave the shuttle until this turn, knowing now that you can't physically get back into your half of the board without flying directly in front of the shuttle. Yeah, there is a large area of space that Dash is not allowed to be, and it's mostly where the rocks are, which makes me quite sad. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. I think I'd have been thinking about the too hard last turn as well but i think adam is right actually i think that getting the shuttle stressed were you to try and double back with dash then as you say adam there's a risk the shuttle doesn't get a shot all game at that point and i don't think your list can afford to lose that firepower the other worry is if dash doubles back echo is way too far away to be able to do anything about that fade isn't a reasonable spot for it especially with the tie being able to go into that gap and sort of mess around a wedge if necessary just to sort of provide a bit of a roadblock. But it's essentially in that situation, Vader versus Ollie's list. And Adam, what are you thinking about in terms of target priority at this point? 
Wedge looks the most vulnerable, but we've got the power of dash here. You know, assuming he is going to do that three bank to the right, you can go for Wedge, but you're likely to be sat at range three of dash, which is not really where you want to be. So my thoughts here um, are the main issue is what I want to do with Echo. This is sort of the shuttle's moves kind of dictated for for him, which isn't ideal. Same with the TIE Fighter. Uh, so it's sort of the other two ships. I, I did consider going super aggressive this turn with Echo, and there's definitely an argument for that. But because I can't go super aggressive with Vader as well, kind of slows me down a bit. I said I'm not sure if that's the correct decision here. But that's the thinking there is I've got to take the shots that I can and, uh, as Ollie said in the previous bit, try not to lose the game right now and play for the following turn. So, yeah, primarily keeping things safe and then hopefully getting into a position to, to dive into that range one bubble of, of dash the turn after this next one. And that, that sounds like a sensible approach. Um, and Ollie, from your point of view, correct me if I'm wrong about the dash move and then Tell me about your options with Wedge and also with Jake, who is starting to look like he, he might start to lag a bit. And I think I'd worry that if Adam does succeed in kind of delaying the engagement, maybe even another turn, that he may get to a position where he can pick Jake off from behind uh, whilst the rest of your list runs away. Yeah, so I always like to try and keep Jake a little bit behind the other two ships, um, mainly because he struggles to go slowly. Um, and loves passing his focus tokens after he boosts. So realistically, you need a four straight distance in between. Also, if your opponent is chasing Jake, then that is exactly what I'm hoping, because as much as he's an amazing focus token passer, he is only 34 points. Uh, obviously, in this, he's more expensive. He's got proton rockets. But yeah, in this, I'm thinking, okay, well, Dash needs to just get away. Uh, he can either do uh, a one bank or a three bank, he probably doesn't want a hard turn, so yeah, I'm probably just going to be banking up the board here. With Wedge, I've managed to delay it to a point, but Wedge is still in trouble. So what I'm thinking here is that I just need to get him onto something expensive. So either the Shuttle, Echo, or Vader, and it needs to be a good shot. It needs to be a focus and a target lock. So if I can't get him out of trouble, I need him to just joust things at this point. So dial in an aggressive move and go from there. And we see the opening. Do you click out with Echo? Adam, you were saying that you still don't want Echo uh, to be the kind of primary target. Maybe we'll sort of see at the end of this turn. Uh, I feel like that's, that's maybe a turn too many, keeping him safe, uh, but we'll see. A nice position from the TIE Fighter. Going to get good shots into something you would have thought. Uh, and also limiting Wedge's options for heat to hard turn. And as you worried, that bank does indeed clip the debris. So not able to get that double mod out of the shuttle sitting there with a stress uh, and options already a little bit limited for next turn but depending on where dash goes that might not be too bad he might be able to kind of turn to chase uh, ollie turning jake in here and and jake with wedge with foils has options yeah absolutely so obviously i can i can boost wedge here if i want to um but i'm probably not going to be able to barrel roll i thought a long time about whether to go up behind dash and support dash or support wedge and because of the fact that I've still got the Proton Rockets and Jake can be a big distraction in this turn, because if anything that shoots Jake, it's not shooting Wedge. So I thought, OK, let's get Jake stuck in. Maybe the tie will shoot me and doing the boost here will allow me to decide what to do with, uh, with Wedge. Now, I'm deciding which one to give the focus token to because I've boosted now so I can, I can give it to either Wedge or Dash. And I'm thinking, OK... I know that Dash is doing a three bank to the right. Adam doesn't. I'm guessing that Adam did know. <laughs> but I, I dialed in a three hard to the left with Wedge. I wasn't expecting this TIE fighter to be quite so aggressive. So I was thinking that if I could do the three hard to the left and then a boost, I could block Vader, which was why I'd originally planned to give the focus token to Dash. So Dash could double mod, Wedge could block Vader and get out of trouble. But with the TIE fighter being there, I didn't really want Wedge to trade with Vader because I thought the shuttle would also get a shot into Wedge. So I thought, well, you know what? If I boost Wedge to the right, then I can still do the three hard. I'll stay stressed, but I'll either get a good shot onto Echo or the shuttle. So that's what I decided to do. I thought, okay, I can get Wedge out of trouble because Vader shouldn't be able to shoot him because, again, the TIE fight is in the way and there's no way for Vader to realistically get a good shot on Wedge after the three hard. Yeah, because he's just going to be that little bit too far around. And Adam, again, TIE fighter in a nice position for itself, uh, but not quite such a nice position for Vader. Exactly. Um, 
But from the last turn, I didn't like any of Vader's options because all it takes is Ollie to do the three bank that he's done. TIE Fighter's kind of in the way, and then Dash does a lot of damage in return. So in this turn, it's we take it slow, and the key is just to not get shot by Dash. Yeah, and that seems sensible. I think you don't want to compound one error with another. And if, if there wasn't a way of getting a lot of uh, attacking output from Vader, then I think getting him as safe as possible uh, is is a good idea. Um, doesn't look like it's quite worked here. You've got range, but by a millimeter, look like you don't have obstruction. Slightly worrying, um, but nevertheless, are taking the lock. Saying that, it's probably an advantage to not have the uh, the trick shot active. Oh, of course, I'd forgotten entirely about trick shot. So actually, yes, that does that does work in your favor. I'm going to barrel roll here. You'll see in a sec, because even then, I don't like the idea of taking a four dice mm. with a focus shot. I've played a lot of dash, and I know that a lot of dash games come down to eventually I will roll five hits and can't do anything about that. So. Four versus four is in Dash's favor. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so absolutely taking the lock, linking into the barrel roll here with Vader's ability uh, and not going to get shot by Dash. Uh, and got yourself a nice shot on Jake sitting there on a the focus. Be nice to be able to get him to spend it uh, prior to those pockets going into the shuttle here. And we start with the first attack dice of the game. So, Ollie is first player, wedge shooting first. Has range one into the shuttle or range three into Echo. Yeah, I decided here to go for combined firepower. I know I've got the proton rocket shot from Jake. I've got a four dice gun from Dash. It seems like doing as much damage as possible to the shuttle here was a good idea. And then this happened. Nice. So, yeah. Um... I think uh, I think a decent plan, uh, you know, focus of aid and three dice uh, or two dice as it would have been, uh, not necessarily going to take much damage. But um, that is four damage, no agility from a shuttle that's facing wedge, uh, and no shields on the shuttle in one shot. That is not a bad outcome, especially uh, seeing as you have not had to spend that focus. Uh, so we're now over to the Vader shot. Nice two hits initially. Spends the lock. Uh, no fire control system on this Vader, uh, but nevertheless gets hit, hit, crit. Yeah, Vader doesn't mind too much. He, uh, yeah, I'm putting some good damage into Jake here. Yeah, so one sneaking through. A shame for Adam that, that Jake has not been forced to spend that focus, but but an early damage onto a four health ship is always a, always a nice feeling. And they were rolling through onto Dash. Uh, Dash here with his two focuses uh, because the perceptive co pilot and with. Bistan as a gunner, who says uh, that if you have a focus token remaining after your first shot, you can take a shot at a different target. Um, so <laughs> opening up, continuing the good dice from Ollie, mm. uh, is a focus spend for four hits into the TIE Fighter, sitting there on evades. And not quite enough, uh, spends the evade to take a damage. Uh, and mm. that is not a bad outcome for what is presumably not your most important shot of this turn. Yeah, as uh, Adam was saying earlier, Sometimes Dash just does that, and the more shots you can get with that massive cannon, the more chance you have of just getting those four symbols straight out of hand. And yeah, when that happens, you take the most of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not quite so good on the follow-up shot there. Um, just rolling hit, hit, crit. And evade from the shuttle is nice, but still takes a hit, crit. And oof, the crit is a hull breach. Uh, four health left. But all of a sudden, this procket looks very scary. Any thought about not spending the procket? In fact, uh, let's talk through the dice result, and then uh, maybe you can tell us if there's kind of any reason to save the procket for later on. Um, we get a nice hit, hit, crit. Spend the focus. Doesn't think twice. And the blank means even without the hull breach, this would be a dead shuttle. Uh, and as it is, I think we have a bit of a pause here while you deal about 75 damage cards to the shuttle. I think I hold breach fuel leak double damage twice or something silly. Yeah. So I was I was seriously considering whether or not I spent my proton rockets here because with four health left on the shuttle, it's not a guaranteed kill. Um, I've only got a good chance of getting four hits as it is, and then the shuttle needs to not get that evade. Plus, with the Tie Fighter and possibly the shuttle shooting back into a then focusless Jake, seemed like a risk. But then he pulled the hell breach, and you yeah. With one agility and a hull breach, you think, okay, I've got a fairly good chance of getting a direct hit in there. Three face-up damage cards, you should get at least one double. And uh, you've got really good odds of killing the shuttle. And 
offense turned into the best defense because if the shuttle isn't shooting you back then that's good news yeah absolutely and as we see this echo shot going in here hit hit crit into wedge this could even it up a little bit oof but not with rolls like that spends the focus takes no damage so far we've got a tie fighter left to shoot looks like a range one just into jake or a range two into wedge looks like we can maybe going into wedge here yeah range two into wedge but no mods and no hits so yeah we see the power there of the initiative kill that is a 51 point coordinating ship three dice gun taken off the board before it has done really anything of any value and not much to show for it adam no um <laughs> far from an ideal turn but ali did a really good job of getting wedge into a really strong position and then just focusing down the ship that was already not in the best spot. After this game, I actually went through the setup for this list in a separate game on TTS just to sort of figure out how you can do it with the shuttle in the corner, which means the shuttle doesn't hit the debris. I don't think it matters in this situation a huge amount, but it sort of means that Ollie has to consider multiple options that the shuttle has rather than sort of the obvious one. Yeah, and it was, it kind of, it felt like gold begets gold on that turn because I rolled so well with Wedge that I didn't spend the focus and then I didn't hit the shield from Echo. No, there was a lot of things that went in my favor, but I think what's still happening is that this little academy is doing a better job blocking you than he is blocking me at this point. And I think that's what the biggest contributing factor is, I think, to the slightly better position that I managed to get in that engagement. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the dice went about as well as they possibly could for you. Yeah. But you had put yourself into a position to take advantage of that. And mm. and I think actually that's, you know, Adam ha very much hasn't done it here. And I think that's to his credit. But I think when, when a lot of players, you hear them after a game talking about the dice, it's really easy to focus on the fact that Ollie rolled nothing but paint on that turn. Uh, but much more difficult to go back, especially, you know, in a real life game where it's not recorded, where you can't run back through it. Um, to go back and kind of realize that, that why that happened was not the amazing dice. Why that happened was a couple of small mistakes, um, which kind of ruined what otherwise was looking like a really, really nice approach. Adam, great to hear that. You know, your instant uh, reaction there was not to blame the dice, but to, to go back and, and try and fix it for next time. I think that is something that I recommend that anybody does if they want to get better X-Wing, either on, uh, on TTS or, or when hopefully we get back to the table. After the game, running back three things, setting the ships up again and seeing what you could have done differently is definitely the way to get better. From here, what's the plan now? So the plan is we need to close distance on Dash. Uh, to prevent those sorts of shots that we've already talked about multiplying. The issue is that Vader's in a tough spot to do that. This turn, not necessarily because of the Academy tie, but I do have a concern here that the Academy tie moves out the way. But Jake fits into that spot, blocks Vader, and Wedge and Dash potentially do some damage into Vader. And that's a concern here. Um, so yeah, it's a, again, um, it's a tough spot to be in, but we're in one of those situations where I'm having to try to guess Ollie's move, and the more times he can make me do that, the more chances I have of getting that wrong. Absolutely, and I suppose the last thing before we, we go over to Ollie to sort of hear his thoughts on, on this turn, interested to hear what he's going to do with Dash. Echo we see here decloaking away, and I think on this turn... That's sensible. You don't really want to go head to head with Wedge, and you want to try and put him into a position that that maybe Wedge is going to find it slightly more difficult to shoot him. Um, but on the previous turn, in hindsight, uh, easy to say, but maybe should have been a bit more aggressive. Or maybe if you were, do you think you just end up losing Echo instead of the shuttle, and maybe even in a worse position? I think in this matchup, that being more aggressive would have been the better shout. Um especially when we knew the shuttle was in a bit of an awkward spot. So sort of the two bank followed by the three bank from from echo and then just focus up and know that you're going to probably be in something's way or at least get a better shot than the range three into wedge i think would have been the better shout uh, but again hindsight's great yeah absolutely everything's easy uh, after the game is over right ollie you've got a few options here this is i think is a position where 
up to now and getting that first round of good fire out of dash is relatively easy and the real skill of dash is kind of knowing what to do in the following turns i think if it was me i think i'd have been tempted to do the hard turn there and maybe try and duck back into the center of the board over the next couple of turns you've gone for the bank and, and can you kind of talk me through that did you ever consider the hard turn and, and why did you go for the bank i did consider the hard turn a lot there was a couple of factors that meant i didn't do it um wedge was in the way for one uh, so i would have risked getting very very close to that asteroid um i also really dislike pointing towards echo or any phantom um because they have such a good ability to block you and if you're pointing towards them with your arc facing sideways um it's very very difficult to do anything about it and you can see here i've changed facing of my arc for two reasons one because i'm going to get a trick shot and two for next turn uh, the other reason i was considering is that vader coming in the side i've got to keep range from vader so if I'd have hard turns, there was a serious risk of a hard three and afterburners boost into range one from Vader, and I had to avoid that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that you'll notice I didn't do the three bank, and that was also quite important because I don't want Dash to get too close to the corner. Um, what I've allowed here is doing the one bank is I still have options next turn to do a four forwards and really try and get out of trouble. But again, as Adam was saying, trying to provide as many opportunities for him to guess wrong, Dash now has a lot of options as opposed to having an obvious option. And we can see here Echo in a nice position to block Dash next turn, but looking like she might have to be slightly lucky to make it to next turn. Opening up with the wedge shot here, range one again, single mods. Thinks about for a moment about keeping it, but, but spends for a hit hit crit into a single dice phantom and uh, losing the shields there on the first shot. Vader here again, uh, Adam being cautious, not wanting to stray into that into that range bubble of, of dash. As a result, hadn't gone quick enough to use his afterburners and left firing into Jake, who, despite the three hits, has once again evaded, having to spend his focus on this occasion. And still sort of paying the price of really having to be super careful about, about engaging Dash. Dash here with that trick shot. Five dice, bit scary for Echo this. Uh, but much worse dice this time. Just the one hit. Uh, Echo breathing a sigh of relief. Gets the natural evade and, uh, and gets to keep her tokens for attack. And it's... Uh, I, I could have taken the target lot there, but I decided no... It's probably better to ride the variance and get that five dice trick shot. Yeah, absolutely. And it does, of course, leave you a, uh, a token for defense as well. Uh, two, do two hits coming in here from Echo. But the obstruction working out in your favor and two evades there from Dash and no further damage. The little TIE fighter that could uh, is going to have to start doing something. Last turn, no hits. This turn has a shot into Wedge. Spends a hit crit, a bit better than previously. Ooh, and the first genuinely bad dice there from Ollie. And that's shields down on Wedge. So trading shields on Wedge for shields on Echo, not a terrible outcome, given the position you went into the turn, Adam. But again, that, that kind of caution with Vader. And I can't criticize you because, as you say, you know, get him at, at range three of dash once and maybe, you know, you get half pointed. But it's he's going to have to get involved at some stage, you feel. Yeah, that was a bit cautious. Like I said, I was worried about the block from Jake, but the counter to that is just that limits Dash's options if that's what he does. So I, yeah, I really think going fast with Vader would have been the shout there just to start putting some pressure in. Echo, obviously it wasn't a great shot because Ollie did a good job of calling what I was going to do, uh, but the thought was just I need to get in because if I decloak away again, it's still probably going to potentially take two turns for me to get into sort of the safest place to be versus Dash. Um, it's not exactly safe, but it's safer than taking four dice shots. Yeah, definitely. And it, it was interesting because I I changed the strategy a little bit up into this turn because I killed the shuttle and I was that far ahead. I could afford to go a lot more aggressive because if we trade evenly at this point, I will eventually win the game. So my thinking was, OK, I can now use dash and wedge less as aces and more as a battering ram and just go, OK, I just need to kill as quickly as possible, one more of Adam's ships, because once it's dash and wedge against two, then they should win that fight. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you can see there that both of those ships 
could have fallen victim to Vader. You know, the arc rotate from Dash left Vader the avenue to come in and, and focus on either. But being so far ahead has meant that even if Vader were to do some damage to either of these ships, you'd probably still ahead on the damage race. And as you say, keep trading and you should win. So Dash, in a, a little bit more of a tricky spot here. Echo obviously has, has a number of options to try and get the block. And Adam, Vader here, is this a turn to go aggressive? Well, I mean, I think the turn to go aggressive is last turn, the turn before, and possibly the turn before that. <laughs> very fair, very fair. But definitely this one. I think he's crying out to get in and to actually start swinging because he is the best damage dealer in the list and he's been relegated so far to taking two range three shots into an A-wing for very little effect. So yeah, he needs to start making an impact and to that end, uh, Vader does come in quite aggressively this turn. Yeah, and although we're, we're sort of talking about this as uh, that it's not going great, actually, you're only 51 points behind. Um, there's three ships on either side of the board. And Ollie is now in a position where not really getting as much benefit last turn from that hammer approach that you went for. Both your ships kind of getting jammed up in this corner. And if Echo can come up with a way to survive this turn, starting to look a little bit tricky for you, Ollie. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you've always got to remember when you're down in the game, especially for this case with Adam, is, OK, he's lost his shuttle. But you were going to lose the shuttle anyway. Realistically, what's going to win you this game is going to be Vader and Echo. And they are still in a position to get some good shots. The Academy can get the way. So now that he's got me in that corner, how much can he do with it? And because of that, I'm thinking, all right, I need to try and be a bit tricksy. I need to try and get a ship off the table as quickly as possible. Can't really do that to Vader. So where is Echo going to go? And I need to make sure with only three hull... I need to make sure that one of my ships gets onto Echo. So I thought about all the possible positions that she, she could end up in and thought, OK, what's more, most likely and what will make sure that wherever she goes, at least one of my ships will get a shot? Yeah, and on that, Adam, we see the TIE fighter kind of coming over the top of Wedge there. And I was kind of expecting the barrel roll down into the corner for the block. What was your thought process there in, in not doing that? I'm obviously assuming that Wedge is coming into the corner here. Maybe you thought differently. I wasn't 100%. It's kind of a greedy focus, um, which, as we see, it turns out to be a mistake because that's exactly where the barrel roll would have put the Academy tie. But the idea was to move the Academy tie and hopefully use that threat of a three-dice focus where I know I can spend that focus and try and use that to keep a bit of pressure on Wedge. I think it's a case sometimes you get when you're down in games where you think, well, this option's a really good option as long as they don't do this one particular move. And then that one particular move is the most obvious and best move that you can do. So why wouldn't they do it? And this is what Ali just makes correct choice after correct choice in this situation. Yeah, I, I certainly have that in where I kind of think through 75 different options, choose something. And as soon as I finish moving my ships, it's like, well, why is he going to do anything other than the one bank, which I haven't played for? You know, what am I thinking? And it sort of all becomes clear just too late. And, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say that, but actually the barrel roll would have been playing for the obvious move. And it's entirely possible, Ollie, that you don't go for the obvious move. You go for the one straight forward to try and boost around the corner. And the TIE fighter turns out to be in a perfect position. It's something that I've actually had to retrain myself to do. I found that I was losing a lot of games recently because I was trying to block sort of the second or third best move, thinking, oh, no, my opponent's going to outthink me. And like he knows that that's the best move, so why don't I go for this one and try and be clever? But realistically, most of the game of X-Wing is just trying to predict the most likely outcome. So if, if you make sure that you're stopping the most likely outcome, then unless it's sort of three or four turns in a row that your opponent is calling you out on it, then maybe you need to start changing things up. But at this point, seems good. And Vader is now fully operational. Yeah, but got that nice range one shot from Wedge and Echo with a hell breacher, but down to one health. So that hell breach is irrelevant, but the fact he's on, on one health is very relevant. Yeah. Vader coming in here, trying to make it all okay. But when you need him, slightly fails you. Hit crit. <laughs> Wedge with the clutch paint. Uh, spending that focus that he yet again didn't need on offense uh, and not taking any damage from Vader here. And now, although at range one, with three dice and the 
double mods, I believe. Dash has a good chance of taking Echo off the board before he shoots. Uh, does exactly that. Three hits. Nothing you can do about that with two evade dice. And that's huge. That combination. If Echo had stuck around to take that shot range one into Wedge, we might be looking at a very different situation. But as it is, a second ship initiative killed. A second ship that is not going to fire uh, on the turn it dies. And no further shots this round. Yeah, Ollie, I think that's a really good point you make. I think it was the crates a few years ago who were talking about that everyone was bad at X-Wing, so you just do the most obvious move because your opponent isn't good enough to predict it. And I think that that's wrong, but how I would phrase it was the best move is the best move. So if you do the best move every time, that's the percentage play for getting the right outcome and starting to do more and more suboptimal moves for fear that someone might block them or might have a good plan against the best move you can certainly start to overthink things and kind of outplay yourself yeah so i don't think everyone is bad at x-wing uh i certainly don't think our viewers are bad at x-wing um hope not after <laughs> after so many episodes um and uh, and i think but i still think that trying not to overcomplicate it working out what the best move is uh, and doing it is often the best approach yeah and going back to when you were talking about ace play earlier that is exactly what you end up doing with ace play is working out the move that will allow you to make that decision as late as possible and that's why as you said i love approaching it at a 45 degree angle because you can always decide to boost in or boost away or barrel roll in or barrel roll away there's always that last minute change of decision that you can do once you have perfect information so it's good to guess but it's better to know so that's why stuff like sense is so powerful i suppose yeah absolutely As, and, and you, you put it beautifully you want to you want to be making that decision about whether you're engaging with your reposition when you know where everything is rather than with either dialed in move when you have no idea where your opponent's going to go or indeed you're guessing where your opponent's going to go um so there's still a game on here, uh, although it's looking very tricky for Adam. TIE Fighters come around into a very aggressive position, uh, but it looks like he's going to be causing wedge problems one way or the other. Mm. Has finally got into that magic range one bubble of dash. Didn't help you very much last time, Adam, but, but you're kind of looking much better now. And we wait to see the wedge move here. The choice really between running away and being aggressive, Ollie, and it looks like you've chosen aggression. Yeah, wedge was on borrowed time. He just needs to shoot things at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And then if he can kill or seriously harm this TIE Fighter, let alone do some damage to Vader, you're probably looking uh, in, a, in a decent position. And Vader sliding in here, going to take a lot of fire this turn, uh, but is going to get what looks like a decent shot into Wedge. Wedge to fire first, range one into the TIE Fighter. Yeah, so I, I changed my mind at the last minute here. I was going to go for Vader, but then I considered, well, I've got the focus target lock onto the TIE with Dash. And I was expecting Vader to go somewhere else. So with, with that position, I thought, well, I've got two shots onto a two health tie. I might be able to keep Wedge alive here because he's still on four health. And if I can kill a TIE fighter, then just Vader probably won't kill him. Absolutely. How is he still on four health? But yes, he Indeed. is. Um, and uh, you do exactly that. Chip a damage into the TIE fighter. Only one health left for Dash to deal with. Nice hit from Vader. Uh, and finally, some blanks. Uh, so hit crit going into Wedge, but uh, is going to need that TIE Fighter to finish him off. And not only did you do damage, but the TIE Fighter had to spend its focus to stay alive. Yeah. So Wedge takes a hit and a wounded pilot, and we get Dash. I did initially think that Dash would have to choose between Vader and the TIE here, but obviously with Bistan, he doesn't. And a good initial roll, hit, hit crit. We need... Natural evades from the TIE Fighter. Don't get them. And another ship that's not shooting on the turn it dies. Uh, and we still have two more shots into Vader. Adam, this doesn't look great. For this game, as, as an individual game, getting aggressive uh, was probably the only way. Like, I don't think that I'm sufficiently better than Ollie or better than Ollie at all to be able to dance around and sort of try and pick my way through and sort of nickel and dime my way into getting ahead in points. So it's get aggressive and hope for a variant swing sometimes is the option that you've got. Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, in a tournament setting, I've got to try and take Wedge off just for the MOV because there is a cut in this event. Um, and that's got to be on my mind. Absolutely. And it, and it nearly works. You know, the, 
Vader did decent damage into Wedge. Wedge had that unmodded shot, which you know could have could have one shot the Tie Fighter, but but equally you know could have done nothing. Three dice into two with no mods, and had the Tie Fighter survived, not impossible for Wedge to die. So I think, given the game state, that was the correct choice. But it hasn't quite paid off for you here. Still looking in position, I would have thought my focus at this point was would very much be to try and kill Wedge before the game ends. Absolutely. There's also the idea that the optimistic idea that killing wedge without taking too much damage in return and having vader versus the other two ships it's not the worst situation to have an above half vader running at a full health dash yeah and he can do it as as you say sometimes it's uh if you're down in the game throw the ships in there especially if you've got three attack and three agility sometimes you can just get that run of luck that can put you back into the game. So once Wedge goes down, Vader can kill Dash. He can do it. And that would obviously be enough. Um, in a slightly tricky place here, and I, I think that's absolutely correct. I think the things that make it maybe less likely are now Dash is, looks to be out of the difficult spot he's been in for the last couple of turns, probably free to run away towards his beloved uh, obstacles over the next couple of turns while vader hopefully deals with wedge but we shall see um whilst we watch the rest of the game uh play out adam you've said a little bit over the course of the game about maybe a couple of slight mistakes in the opening maybe you need to be a little bit more aggressive because of that what were your kind of major takeaways for this list from this game and is it a sort of list archetype that you'd stick with after this well i haven't actually run it since then um but i was doing all right with it at the time i ran it in some of the sith taker events but i sort of moved over to the rebel stuff because that's my favorite faction and then the new ships came out to go back to this at some point i think i'd run simran's original version with pure sabak instead of echo which allows you to get a few more toys as well if you want to play that ship it's a bit cheaper gets fire control on vader which is quite useful and I think it just begets being more aggressive because you can't not be aggressive with a striker. That is something that I think I need to learn. I remember seeing a video where Ali said that Vader is essentially a jousting piece. And I think I was trying to be a bit too cute and try and sort of dance around a bit too much rather than coming in. So my main takeaway is sometimes, even with three agility ships that move last, you do need to just get in there and start rolling as many dice as possible it's funny because in this game even though i'm lower initiative dash is the ace and vader is the jouster if you put echo psi and vader all together with the little academy to block things and point them at something whatever's in front of them will evaporate yeah and we're seeing exactly that here um so vader going for the joust range one of wedge only takes one shield yet to be halved uh, and having to spend his focus, but doing so for three hits and a crit on attack, and that is finally a dead wedge. So couldn't have said that at a better time, Adam. We're seeing the power of Vader as that kind of battering ram jouster. Unfortunately, now going to have to take a rear arc shot, looks to be just at range two um, with no mods. But you know, had that happened at the start of the game, Certainly you'd be looking like you'd be in a, in a better position than you are now. Um, and I also thought it was a really nice point. It, it's the benefit of running a list, I think. the What seems like a perfectly reasonable change to take out Pure Sabak, who is a bit of a one-trick pony, certainly never sticks around long, and put in a, get a, a ship that is much more versatile, that seems like a sensible change. That seems like you're making the list better. But actually, it feels like it might have unbalance the list and, and might have forced you into playing in a way that doesn't really suit the list do you think that's a kind of fair assessment yeah i do i think the concern originally was just that i didn't want two ships that would have a short shelf life like the shuttle will go down or not become an attacking threat after a couple of turns of combat and similar thing with pure sabak uh, if anyone's got sort of the right idea so you've got to you've got to take him out so the idea was to bring echo in because one i'd not run a phantom before and two, it allows you to sort of continuously fire over multiple turns while staying in good positions. Uh, but what I've learned from playing it, not just in this game, but in the other games, is you can ignore Echo. And if you can focus down Vader, Echo won't be able to win those games later on if you don't do sufficient damage back. 
Um, it is a three dice gun. It is a three dice gun that's probably going to be single modded unless you've got the shuttle around. Even if you can continuously stay out of arcs, it's going to take a while to push through the requisite amount of damage. So thinking that way, Pure Sabak is the better shape because you absolutely cannot ignore that ship and having two ships that can hit incredibly hard that aren't Vader means that there are things that need to be dealt with before Vader. And that probably means that I could, if I played Pure Sabak, I could probably play the more passive style with Vader that I've used in this game. Um, whereas I just wasn't able to put enough damage through earlier while playing passive with the ships that I have. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You haven't managed to get Vader to the end game that is winnable for him. We see Vader taking two damage the previous turn, Talon rolling, valiantly trying to put some damage into Dash, uh, but failing to do so. And Dash has closed this out for you, Ollie. Congratulations on the win. Really nicely played. Uh, actually, I think both of you played a really nice opening, um, mm. and it really was marginal, marginal mistakes, uh, I think is, is, is even a bit harsh, but marginal things in, the, in the, that final turn before the approach that swung it in your favor, Ollie. Talk us through this game, uh, and then maybe as a sort of closing thought, Dash is a ship I see a lot of people play in leagues uh, when they don't have to play more than one game with him. But I don't really see people doing very well with him at major tournaments. What's your feeling on him? It feels to me like he's sort of B tier. He's not quite there. But then you watch a game like this and it's hard to see why. So it was really interesting. I took him to two of the Gold Squadron events. And I, I put a serious amount of time and effort into this list earlier in the year because I thought it was the best counter that I had to Nantex. It is, it is interesting to see other good players such as um, Bartosz Wojcicki uh, also taking him for the exact same reason but neither of us did well enough with him at the tournament and i think it comes down to what we were saying at the start of that variance problem because even with jake support um even with bistan the whole idea of dash is that if you roll dice enough times you're eventually going to get hits but sometimes you just don't and in in those games say for example you're playing against a, a seven ship swarm with three agility You've got Wedge, but Wedge is a jousting monster and will probably kill one and a half, maybe two ships before he inevitably dies to all of the mass firepower coming back. So then it's dash on his own with Jake support versus five ships. And if your opponent rolls a little bit above average, if dash rolls a little bit below average, then you're just going to lose that game. And there's only so long you can fly around the board before you do eventually get trapped in a corner. So I feel like... What Dash needs is he needs to not be the last ship on the board every time. That has been the best time to the best way to play him up until now. I'm really curious to see, instead of running him with Wedge, what would happen if you run him with two A Wings now that we have the new Rebel A Wings. Um, so I feel like if Dash is then the first thing to die, but you've killed enough points to win with those two expensive but very hard to kill a-wings at the end of the game then maybe that could be a new way to play him i'm not sure i found a similar thing in the in the top division of the sith taker league which was just people were because in that you can pick and choose the lists between games and i think that it felt really good in that situation because people were not always picking the most optimal combinations of things or in some cases people were falling back on old favorites see too many swarms at the time personally i really liked running lando and i stole this idea from brendan morrissey uh, the australian fella he points out that lando is a really good end game ship if you can kill the right things because he's got two actions and he can spend the most of the game just powering your dash to roll a million dice it came down to i think it's an incredibly one-dimensional list and just trying to kite things forever it's just not going to work as consistently as you want it to because someone's going to do something really clever, get in your way, and then you're going to lose a game. So I think Dash is in a really interesting spot, and whoever finds the the correct thing for Dash is going to, is going to do really well with it. Yeah, really interesting to hear that from both of you. I think that's clarified my thoughts on him a little bit as well. It feels like we're saying that Dash is only ever going to be good versus part of the meta, and we haven't quite yet found the rest of the list to go around him that deals with the bits of the meta he isn't good at. Does that sound like a fair conclusion? I think so. I think the problem with Dash has always been the list building problem because he's so expensive, you need something else. And it feels like he needs to be in a two ship list. And the problem being is that the present two ship lists that you have for Rebels 
is either Luke Skywalker with supernatural reflexes, which dies as soon as someone else brings initiative six, or Lando, which dies to a swarm. So I feel like at this point, we haven't really got the partner for Dash. And maybe with these new A-Wings, we might see some people actually start to complete that puzzle. Well, that sounds horrific. Uh, and it also sounds like a good place to end. Thank you very much for coming on, guys. I thought you both played an excellent game. Definitely, I learned loads from both of your insight. Um, and uh, I'd love to have you on again in the future if you're up for it. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I'd, I'd really like to echo that point where um, that you just said. I really do think that Adam played a fantastic game here. And he got punished for errors that normally wouldn't cost you the game. It felt unfair, um, but I think it's really interesting to be able to review a game like that and see, okay, this is where we could improve, even though both players played really well. Yeah, once I come off the um, the Hera train, I will be back on to trying to run some variants of this with like just with a few changes that I've learned from watching this game. Nice. Okay, uh, and so with that, thank you again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. And we will see you in, all things being well, two weeks with some games from next weekend's Firestorm Cup. Bye-bye.